I'd like to introduce our next speaker. In our practice, we have an on-site dermatopathologist, so we're very lucky that when we take samples, we can go upstairs and look through the microscope and talk with her directly about it. So um, Dr. Michelle Heary uh, from California Skin Institute is here to go over uh, some pearls of dermatopathology specifically in this lecture. She's going to talk about helping us with inflammatory disorders and piecing together uh, what we see in the patient from when we take the biopsy on our end and what she sees on her end through the microscope. Thank you. You got up for me. Yeah, got it, thanks. What a great room. I feel like I'm getting an award. I'd like to thank my parents. Okay. So today we're going to talk about inflammatory dermatoses. I know a lot of people kind of roll their eyes sometimes, especially for a derm path. But keep with me, I'm not going to try and teach you dermatopathology, I'm just going to give you some key points and what to provide your pathologist. So we're going to talk about biopsy technique very briefly. Um, spongiotic dermatitis, psoriasis, uh, lichenoid or interface tissue reactions, and blistering diseases. So a long, uh, quite a bit of uh, time ago, we, there was a a little study in Skin and Allergy News basically showing the top 10 diagnoses in dermatology offices. I think they did about 85 different um, dermatology offices. They looked at the most common diagnoses. And, you know, for inflammatory dermatoses, you need to keep them in mind because they're about a third of the cases that were um, presented to the offices. No one really has a problem, especially after Dr. Cohen's talk, um, looking at these easy, you know, this was actually happened to be a nickel allergy, and this is linear vesicles of poison oak. But then you start getting into things that are a little bit maybe more challenging. This happened to be more of a um, dyshydrotic eczema. This could be fungal infection or a contact. This ended up being atopic um, dermatitis, a papular form. But then you also get the more generic spongiotic derm. What do you do? Do you treat? Do you biopsy? What to do to a drug, contact? You're not really sure. A lot of the times clinicians turn to biopsy to tell them what it is if they can't figure it out um, based on clinical or history. So here's a quick case just to start us off. 52-year-old female with recent onset of an itchy rash now coming in with bullet. There's no new medications and uh, no new topical exposure. Not to say that they're not on some medication, just nothing new. So what would you do? First, wound culture or biopsy, a shave biopsy? How about just treat them and then come back if they're not improved and then do a biopsy? Or start off with a punch biopsy? So if you chose a biopsy, what would you do? Shave or punch? I know I get a lot of either shave or punches for inflammatory dermatoses. The ideal biopsy is a punch biopsy. You need to get the full dermis and sometimes even go into the subcutaneous tissue if you're looking for something like paniculitis. Obviously, your dermatopathologist needs to see the fat. But you need to see the entire dermis. You need to see the vascular plexus. You need to see the adnexal structures. Um, so a shave biopsy is not usually appropriate for any sort of uh, inflammatory dermatosis. Where to biopsy? This is important usually for these, these um, spongiotic dermatitis cases. You want to be interlesional. But say you have a scarring alopecia, don't take it interlesional. You're just going to see a scar. You go perilesional. So at the advancing border, something that's a little bit more effeminous and not quite scarred. Um, and then if you're taking a biopsy for DIF, direct immunofluorescence, if you have a blistering disorder, don't take intralesional, you take perilesional. I'm, not, I'm sure that's probably something that was ingrained in you in schooling, but um, a lot of times people forget. And that's because you can have a false negative if you take it intralesional. So um, especially for um, alopecia, this is important if you, um, uh, how many biopsies to take. So if you're doing uh, work up for alopecia, a lot of the times I get two millimeter punch biopsies. You need to have at least two four millimeter punch biopsies to evaluate for alopecia. And why is this important? Because you actually look at two planes of section. You look at the vertical and you look at horizontal cross section to look at the hairs. That can give you the best diagnosis for alopecia. And then especially for uh, androgenetic causes, you want to 
take a biopsy in the involved area of the scalp and the uninvolved area, just so you can compare the two areas. That's a, 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 one of the major diagnostic features of angiogenetic is the comparison between uh, normal and involved. So don't forget, if you're taking um, your biopsies, think about taking additional biopsies for alopecia and for direct immunofluorescence. So having said all this about biopsies, it's not a routine blood test. It's not going to tell you your answer 100% of the time. A biopsy alone is not definitive. It can lend support to what you think clinically, but a lot of the times it's not gonna be your slam dunk. I don't have to you know, take a history or, or give a differential. I'll just take a biopsy and it'll give me the answer. Why? Because it's a reaction pattern. It's a generic reaction pattern of the skin. A lot of these things will look the same, unfortunately. And a lot of the times, I just give differential diagnoses. So I'll, I'll say this is spongiotic dermatitis, this is differential. Usually, it's key to remember if your pathologist gives you a differential, the first thing that they list is the most likely thing that it is. And then it kind of goes down in descending order, OK? So if you are not getting differential diagnosis from your pathologist, you may have a problem. So be aware of the dogmatic pathologist that says it's this, because some of the times they can be really, really right, and some of the times they're really, really wrong. So they will always give you a differential. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the times I get rule out drug reaction. A biopsy is really not gonna prove it's the rash is due to a drug or not. It can give you clues. It might be. Um, sometimes you see eosinophils. Maybe that'll give you, you know, point you in the right direction. But you don't have to see them. So eosinophils are not really going to, you know, cinch the case. Uh, so for clues, so when I look at the biopsies, there are certain clues that maybe point me in a certain direction. Not necessarily nailing the diagnosis, but kind of pointing me in the right, right direction. And that's mostly based on a few things here. So give me the anatomic site. So if I see spongiosis with some microvesicles in the epidermis, and it's on the lateral aspect of the finger, it's more likely to be a dyshydrosis or dyshydrotic eczema. Or if there's some uh, erythrocyte uh, extravasation in the dermis and it's on the legs, more likely to be a stasis derm. And then this is very important to have the uh, punch biopsy. I look, need to look at the deeper vascular network. If there's a lot of um, inflammation around the, the vessels down there, it could be an arthropod bite or a drug reaction. If I'm only seeing a lot of spongiosis right around the hair follicles, atopic derm or subderm. And then if I'm seeing dying keratinocytes in the epidermis, sometimes, not always, it's due to a drug reaction. So these things sort of point you in the right direction. So what do you want to give your pathologist? You need to give a good history. So is there a new drug or a topical agent? And not just new drug, a drug that could be causing. So a lot of drug, drugs are idiosyncratic in their um, side effects. So yeah, the patient has been on hydrochlorothiazide for 10 years. I don't need to worry about that. Well, it'll, it can still cause a reaction 10 years later. So even though it's not new, let the, let the pathologist know. And then tell me what it looks like. Is it a large plaque? Is there small papules? Is there scale? And where is it on the body? Is it sun exposed only? You know, these things are very helpful in the diagnosis. Um, so really, when you have this clinic, good clinical history and a good biopsy together, most of the time, a diagnosis can be made or at least point you in the right direction. So just, you know, this is what we have on our, um, this is what I would give for a report. So I give the um, reaction pattern. This happened to be a psoriasiform spongiotic dermatitis, and I'll get into what these things mean a little bit later. And I give a differential. And then um, usually you do uh, staining for tinea, just to rule that out. So what are some of the histologic features? So we have what maybe an acute, um, spongiotic dermatitis would look like clinically. And whoops, I, know, I don't know if these terms actually mean anything to you right now, but they will in a minute. So you have something called basket weave orthokeratosis. So this is what we're talking about, the stratum corneum, so the top layer of skin. It's basically normal, is what all that means. It's a normal stratum corneum. It's a very acute process. It just came on. 
And then you have the spongiosis with a microvesiculation, which means there are just some small vessels within the epidermis. Maybe you can't even see them clinically. It doesn't look like a blister. Uh, now, the subacute pattern here is um, defined by parakeratosis. So that just means in the stratum corneum, the top layer of skin, you still have retention of the nuclei. That means it's kind of like a more immature stratum corneum. It's more of a turnover. And chronic lesions like this one are most likely due to psoriasiform hyperplasia. So this is what I'm talking about. This is a nice picture showing spongiosis. So all spongiosis is is edema. It's edema between the keratinocytes. So you have these nice little squamous cells, keratinocytes, and they're held to the next one, the next keratinocyte next to it, with hemidesmosomes. So usually they're nice and tight. You can't see any sort of um, white line around that, and that white line is basically just an artifact of processing. But when they pull apart, you actually, that's where you see these, these little lines here. Those are the hemidesmosomes in between them. So that is spongiosis, it's just edema. And sometimes you get a lot of edema pushing the keratinocytes apart and you get little vesicles. That's all it is. And this one happens to be an acute form because this is the stratum corneum and it's totally normal. This is a subacute, so you still have your spongiosis down here. So that you see the spaces in between the keratinocytes. This is your stratum corneum, and you can actually see little nuclei here and there. So that just makes it a subacute pattern. And that's the psoriasiform. So psoriasiform just means looks like psoriasis. Because histologically, psoriasis has these downgrowths of the epidermis in, into the dermis like that. Um, there are subtle differences, which again, I'm not really gonna go into in detail, the difference between psoriasis and psoriasiform and spongiotic dermatitis. Um, but needs to say, Sometimes you can't always tell them apart, especially if you take a biopsy on the acral um, area looking for spongios spon uh, psoriasiform spongiosis versus psoriasis. They can look very similar. So there are many different differential diagnoses for sponge derm. These are the most common ones that I come up with in my, in my practice you know, on a daily basis. Okay. When you specifically see a lot of eosinophils, sometimes that can point you in a certain direction. And these are the most common ones that I see a lot of eosinophils in. Now, if you clinically are worried about a blistering disorder, like one of these first three, remember to take another biopsy, a second biopsy, for direct immunofluorescence. And always, always, always look in the report and make sure the pathologist has ruled out tinea. Your KOH may be negative, but that's not always you know, gonna help you. You need to look for a PAS stain. Did they look for fungus? Sometimes in acute lesions, you don't really need to do a PAS stain to look for fungus. I haven't really seen too, too many cases where it's positive, but once you start getting subacute to psoriasiform, you still need to test for it. So psoriasis, you know, briefly, the beautiful pictures of erythematous plaques with a silvery scale, and that's more of a guttate pattern. But what does it look like to me? Well, kind of looks like that psoriasiform spongiosis picture. You have those down growths again, the psoriasiform growth of the epidermis, but here there's actually not any spaces. You can't see any spaces here. There's really not much in the way of spongiosis. So unless you take an acral biopsy, you're not going to really see any spongiosis. And of course, there are other um, characteristics for psoriasis. Uh, you have neutrophils in the stratum corneum. Um, but just suffice it to say, um, they can appear similar on acral surfaces, but um, usually a, a psori a psoriasis on a biopsy is pretty definitive. What about lichenoid or interface dermatitis? Well, the stereotypical lichenoid dermatitis is lichen planus. And don't forget, you can have lichen planus of the fol hair follicles. It's lichen plano pilaris. Um, so that can cause alopecia. Lichenoid drug reaction and lichen planus-like keratoses. So you may get um, a, a, a diagnosis from your pathologist basically saying lichenoid tissue reaction and give you a differential of lichen planus or lichenoid drug reaction, especially if they see a couple of EOs here and there. So you may, again, even for these 
entities, you may not get a definitive diagnosis. If you're getting something, if I have some, uh, a biopsy that comes in, rule out basal cell carcinoma, more likely it's a solitary lesion. It's going to be like in, plan of, uh, like in uh, planus like keratosis. And don't forget, all of these um, entities as well have a lichenoid or interface dermatitis that you need to um, have on your differential if, that's, if that is what you're seeing clinically. And lupus can cause alopecia. I know I'm kind of really big on the alopecias, and, but that's, it's really important, it's, especially for biopsies, because that is the one place I notice that it's, it's not biopsied correctly. And you can't make a diagnosis then, or at least the pathologist can't. So this is a clinical picture of lichen planus. And this is what I see under the microscope. So this is what I'm talking about when I say a lichenoid or interface dermatitis. So all of the lymphocytes kind of line up along the border of the dermis and the epidermis. Okay? And sometimes you can't even tell where the epidermis stops and where the dermis begins. And that is an interface dermatitis when you can't tell the difference between the two areas. And when the inflammation is abutting right up to the epidermis from the dermis, you can actually get some of the, uh, the squamous cells dying, and that is a necrotic keratinocyte. So that is very characteristic for lichen planus. But like I mentioned before, you can see that in drug reactions. Usually the dying keratinocytes are a little bit higher up and not right at the, at the um, junction of the dermis and the epidermis. This is LPP, lichen planum pilaris. So again, if you took a biopsy interlesional, all you see is scar. It's not helpful. Okay, so briefly we can talk about um, blistering diseases. And usually we classify blistering diseases based on where the split is. You can have just below the stratum corneum, so subcorneobola, intraepidermal, and subepidermal. And for Today's cases, I'm just going to briefly touch on the uh, sub-epidermal cases. So for our case that came into the clinic, this patient was biopsied. And we'll go into what the biopsy showed in a minute. Just to keep in mind, in adults, if you have a blistering dis uh, disease, it's most likely due to an autoantibody formation, which is different than uh, pediatrics. I don't know if anyone sees pediatrics here. So this is what it looked like. You have, this is the epidermis, stratum corneum is right on top, this is epidermis, and here's this big blister. And there are all these cells in here, and those, that's what it looks like, uh, higher mag uh, magnification. They're all little red cells, those are eosinophils. So this is a sub-epidermal blister with abundant eosinophils, and that's how I would basically sign, that's my top line diagnosis, and then I give the differential. Because without direct different immunofluorescence, that is not, even though it's beautiful for a bullous pemphigoid histologically, you can be thrown off by many different things. So bullous tinea can appear the same way histologically. Uh, a bullous arthropod bite will look exactly the same. Again, it's a reaction pattern of the skin. You need a direct immunofluorescence if you want a definitive diagnosis of, a, of uh, immunobullous disease. And they have different staining patterns. So a pemphigus will have this sort of interwoven, in between the ker uh, keratinocytes staining. And um, bullous pemphigoid will have this beautiful linear staining of IgG. And a der dermatized hepatiformis will have more of a, uh, in the dermal papillae, it would be um, little globules of, in the dermal papillae of IgA deposition. These are just a couple. There are other um, entities, but these are the most common that I see. So don't forget your DIF. Now, I have a lot of um, clinicians that say, I don't want you to test for that because it's expensive. Maybe it's an out-of-pocket out um, patient. Um, no problem. Let your pathologist know that um, if you need to use the biopsy, go for it. Otherwise, hold it, because it can stay in this media, and this is a special media, so it cannot go in formaldehyde okay, or formalin. So special media, hold it. If it looks like it could be BP or some bullous disorder, then use it. No problem. We'll keep it. And if we don't need it, we won't use it. Okay? That's all. Thank you so much.